Hello and welcome to In the Light, Growing Your Soul with me, Anna Isabel. And I am very excited because I have Nicholas Pearson with me today, who is the author of this very exciting book. It's called Flower Essences from the Witch's Garden. Welcome, Nicholas. <clears throat> Thank you so much for having me on the show today. I, I guess a good place to start would be to ask, what are flower essences? Yeah, that's a great place to get started. So there seem to be a lot of misconceptions about what essences are. I think people who know them and love them are, are pretty darn familiar, but it's, it's communicating what they are to that bigger audience. So uh, I think we can unpack what they aren't first. You know, the word flower essence sounds a heck of a lot like the word essential oil. So uh, I can't tell you how many times I've handed a dropper bottle to someone to see them unscrew the cap and take a deep whiff only to be disappointed. Um, they are not essential oils. They, they're, you know, essential oils are distilled or solvent extracted from tons of botanic, botanical material to make these really kind of ultra concentrated volatile oils with, you know, strong aromas. Flower essences are quite the opposite of that. They're subtle and scentless and vibrational. Sometimes they get compared to homeopathic medicines because they go through similar processes of dilution or potentization. And while the founder of modern flower essence therapy, Dr. Edward Batch, um, was a practicing homeopath, he was seeking a different methodology. So it doesn't exactly follow the same principles as um, homeopathic medicine either. And you know, we also sometimes compare them to other kinds of herbal remedies and tinctures and simples and things, but the actual bottle that you're going to get has no phytochemicals in it, no botanical ingredients left over, except for the preservative like brandy or vodka or glycerin. And they're purely vibrational in nature. So with all of that in mind, let's think about what's really in that bottle. On a material level, what we have is water and a preservative to keep you know, slimy, fuzzy stuff from growing in it. And that water is said to be patterned or organized in such a way that it retains the imprint, the kind of soul spark or consciousness out of whatever flower or plant or other remedy might have been introduced to it. And so they work as kind of, um, we'll say, tuning forks for the subtle bodies, for the psyche, bringing us into balance by demonstrating what the imbalance pattern might be. I like that idea um, because, as we know, water holds memory and it, it does respond to emotion. So there's obviously something going on with water beyond what we have been encouraged to believe. So it makes sense that there could be this kind of well, imprint memory of the, of the essence of the flower. So, yeah, absolutely. So I think the next question is, how do they work? Because this sounds almost impossible. Well, you know, let's let's take a look at what we've got as far as clinical, blind, peer-reviewed, published studies go. Uh, we can see that flower essences work. We can demonstrate repeatedly that they work more effectively than placebos, although it, it really depends on how we work with them. We, we can't have a generalized forma be, because they're very, very personalized. So as long as the experimental parameters are right, we can demonstrate time and time again that they are indeed effective. And it's a statistically significant and robust amount of data that tells us this. But the challenge that science has is describing what exactly is causing that effect. So it's what we might call a, a an effect in search of a cause, or you know, it's the, the lock in search of the key. But what I like to think of is, you know, if we imagine what's in that bottle, mostly water. Um, we understand from a like material scientific chemical perspective that water organizes itself in a variety of different shapes and patterns and that in its idealized format it's what we call a liquid crystal mesophase it's a state in between liquidity and crystallinity and the the exact nature of that pattern responds to very very weak stimuli in its environment 
very weak sources of electromagnetism and other forms of energy, including consciousness. Um, and there are like hard scientists who've demonstrated this. And there are also, you know, the softer and pseudosciences that have demonstrated this as well in more anecdotal ways. But essentially what's happening when we take a few drops of that flower essence in the mouth, add it to our beverage, spray it around us, we have to imagine that those water molecules are communicating with our own water molecules. We are functionally mostly water. You know, by mass, we might say somewhere between two thirds and three quarters of our body is water. But by molecular count, because water molecules are extraordinarily tiny, if you tallied up every kind of molecule and uh, every number of each of those kinds in your body, more than 99% by, by number are water molecules. And they also need to exist in a liquid crystal mesophase. So it is quite likely that that organized water is talking to the water in you in a kind of way. They're, they're um, entraining one another, synchronizing with one another to kind of bring that, that patterning, that organization to us in a very visceral way. I also like to think of the things we can't measure yet, you know, the consciousness driven, the soul driven qualities where that spark of energy, that kind of mysterious soul quality of the flower is transferred to the water to be given to us. And that works in a way like, you know, listening to a beautiful piece of music. The, the music itself doesn't make you change, but you often respond in accordance with it. So if we think of it as you know, like the tuning fork analogy, like I mentioned earlier, when we have an out of balance state, when the string in the piano is out of tune, we can strike the tuning fork to find out whether we have to tighten or loosen that string to come into balance. And because real life happens, you know, we keep hitting the keys, which is the hammers connected to them strike the, the strings and, you know, mangle them a little bit over time. So, you know, they wander off pitch. So we take flower essences repeatedly, just like we tune our instruments repeatedly to bring us back into a state of radiant balance. And the great news then is that if we're only ever matching the out of pitch to that idealized pitch, then the wrong flower essence can't do anything at all because it's just not relevant to the note we're trying to tune. It's funny because I was just thinking about attending a seminar a few years back um, at which there was this wonderful uh, vet who is a behaviorist as well, but who seems to also have knowledge of homeopathic remedies. And when someone um, asked her, you know, how, what she felt about them. Um, and in fact, she also was talking about the botch flower remedies um, as well. Um, but she said, it's effective, but you have to know what you are treating because otherwise, it's, it's just not going to work. Well, that makes sense, sense, doesn't it? You have to be aiming for the right thing. Absolutely. And that's much easier said and done with people than it is animals because people can tell you how they feel. And since flower essences are very psychologically, very emotionally driven, uh, we have to be mindful about matching the flower as best as possible to that out of balance state. So, okay. We have an idea of how they work. Um, how can they be used to support us? <clears throat> the simplest method is, you know, if we have this magical little dropper bottle, we can, you know, take it orally, we can add it to food and beverage. Some people like to apply them topically. I did a brilliant seminar, um, a, a longer format course with one of my teachers on uh, floral acupuncture using the, the batch flower remedies on acupuncture sites, acuzones, which was brilliant. You can make them into creams and apply them to the skin. You can uh, add them to spray bottles just like this and, and mist them all around you to have their benefits. Add them to the bath. There are so many ways that we can kind of think outside the box. Um, Dr. Batch began with just administering them orally, and in the case of a, a, a couple patients that he had that were unconscious, he'd, he'd rub them on the lips and found that, that that could have some effect. But over time, almost 100 years later, we've come up with a handful of other ways to work with them that are, are really fun and innovative. And I, I tried to kind of extend that toolbox a little further in the book, going beyond the purely therapeutic and into the more kind of mystical and esoteric and ritual applications of them, too. So what kinds of things might they help us with? So, um, you know, beginning with what we have 
evidenced in peer reviewed journals, we can see that they are excellent for managing stress and the effects of stress. You know, stress shows up in our lives very differently. I think a lot of people who are listening might be familiar with what's called rescue remedy or sometimes known as the five flower formula from Dr. Batch. There are other flower essence makers who've developed their own formulas that work very similar to this. And I mean, you know, you can go to any druggist, any pharmacist here in the States and find it on on the store shelves. You can find it in a lot of grocery stores and natural food stores as well. So this is a really widespread kind of product. But above and beyond the kind of effects of stress and trauma in the moment, we can work with flower essences anytime we feel, for lack of a better word, just out of sorts. If we have, you know, fresh or very old um, patterns that are there, maybe that's fear, maybe that's resentment, maybe that's not being grounded or focused, maybe it's being impatient or, um, you know, not being willing to open up and be vulnerable. There's a flower out there to match every emotional state that we'd like to transmute or transform. And the flowers themselves, they, they kind of straddle a whole spectrum of things. So we might think of the quality we're trying to overcome as one form of it. Um, but, you know, we could look at the very opposite end of the spectrum. And sometimes the same remedy can help us with that. Like, let's look at yarrow as a good example of this. Yarrow is often used for people who feel too open, too vulnerable, too sensitive to their environment, because it can help us filter out the ideas, the emotions, the kind of noise of the world that doesn't serve us. But on the flip side of that, we might also use yarrow if we aren't open enough, if we don't know how to be selectively permeable, how to really begin to, to receive and connect with others. And if we look at the, the signatures of that flower, we can see that the little umbels, the, the little sprays of flowers are all connected to one another. And yet they're still their own discrete little heads of, of even smaller flowers. So there's this theme of connection and separation of, of filtering things out and bringing things in that that's evident right there in the plant itself. So we can, we can imagine that it's not just a single state we're fixing, but it's about coming into that kind of middle state of balance between extremes, whatever those extremes might be, uh, depending on the species. I like that. Would we expect the result to be subtle or would we expect it to be or i say result effect would we expect the effect to be subtle or would we expect the effect to be an immediate kind of wow well i'm going to say mileage may vary according to user i think that's a, a safe way to kind of frame it if we set the expectation that it will be subtle because for most people it is, then those who have the kind of outlier effects um, get to be pleasantly surprised. There, there are a few, I think, really common exceptions to this rule. If we're in that kind of panic or overwhelm or stressed out state, a few drops of rescue remedy, uh, a spray of it in the mouth, a couple drops on a pulse point, and I can feel that relief almost immediately. It's not like the problem goes away but I get this kind of inner clarity or inner space that allows me to handle it a little bit better. So the idea of flower essences is helping us kind of slowly change the fundamental response to whatever that trigger might be for us, whether that's stress or resentment or anger or loneliness, whatever it might be. So when we find the right flower for that, if we have a long standing pattern, if this is a, a condition, a state of being that's been around for quite a long time, we probably shouldn't expect instantaneous relief. That, that would be unrealistic. Even with traditional allopathic medicine, if we have really long chronic conditions. We don't expect overnight relief in most cases. So I think we can picture the action of a flower essence a lot like the action of water flowing on rock. Over time, it can erode away the patterns that, that might be um, trying to obstruct the flow of that water. Maybe it will redistribute it or move it. And, and other times, 
we're lucky enough that it will just outright overpower it. But usually that, that action is subtle and slow and builds over time. And for that reason, we don't just take a flower essence once and go about our life. We, we use them with repetition, with frequency, and sometimes over great durations of time. There are essences I began using as a teenager that I still frequently use today because I still find them beneficial. Um, in your book, you also talk about meditating um, with them. Tell us more about that, because I'm, I'm used to meditating with sacred oils, and I love the idea that I could also meditate with flower essences. Yeah, so, you know, that little bottle has inside it a, a, a somehow both dilute and concentrated dose of plant spirit medicine. It's not concentrated in a chemical kind of sense, but it's it's concentrated in as much that, you know, one drop contains the pattern of the whole consciousness of that flower, of that plant. So we can take a drop or two before meditation as a means of deepening our communion with that plant spirit as a spiritual ally or helper, or we can take a, a few drops of it whenever we have need for the qualities that it embodies to help us in our meditative practice. Maybe that's being more focused or grounded or present, but maybe it's also thinking about what we're trying to manifest outside of the manifestation, we, outside of the meditation rather. Um, other ways that we could do it, you could meditate holding that bottle as a physical reminder. If, if the liquid inside carries the plant spirit energy, why can't we commune with it through the bottle? Um, one of my teachers um, Deborah Creighton also uh, recommends placing them on top of like a, an image of the flower of life and that will kind of project its energy into your space. In the Alaskan essences, um, they do like um, treatments for your space, for space clearing and changing the energy by filling a bowl with water and putting a few drops in there. You could also apply them to a clear quartz crystal cluster one that's been uh, freshly cleansed and kind of cleared beforehand and the crystals will project that energy into your space as well so we've got we've got um, oral methods we've got topical applications but we also have environmental ones and we can meditate in the space filled with that kind of blessing or virtue that comes from the flower itself i find that very exciting and and beautiful i really love that idea so i think going from the idea that we're meditating with this essence it brings me to the the concept of plant spirits so tell us about plant plant spirits i like to describe myself as a feral animist at heart i mean anyone listening so far has probably figured out i really like numbers and data and science i'm i'm definitely a very nerdy kind of guy but I still somehow all, all of that data driven work that I do doesn't discredit the living spark, the animating force in all things. Personally, I actually find it enriches and enhances that because even science fails to explain certain phenomena and even science can't always describe why things happen. It just demonstrates that they do. So, you know, having that inner soul spark, that inner force or spirit within is something that I can commune with in a very visceral and real way. It's also something that humans have been doing long since before the advent of recorded history, long since the advent of our species, Homo sapiens. We have we have archaeological evidence that suggests that the, our hominid ancestors also had certain kinds of spiritual practices that may have acknowledged the spirit of place or the spirit of object or the spirit of plant or animal. So um, you know this is this is nothing new the um, kind of mechanical materialistic view of the world that we so heavily rely upon in today's Western civilized kind of world is relatively recent. And I would say much less sophisticated than an animistic world that views everything relationally and interconnected. So if what's really in that bottle can't be measured yet by science, we, we could probably demonstrate that the water molecules inside are patterned, but we can't really tell you why. Um, so that kind of leaves us this void, this opening. And I think that's the perfect place to point to that spiritual underpinning, that, that soul that's inside the otherwise inert matter. And plant spirits, like human spirits, are many and varied. Plant spirits are 
you know, the embodiment of both the individual plant as well as collective kind of force. Sometimes we refer to that as an oversoul or a deva. So, you know, there's, there's the, the spirit of that oak tree in your backyard or your favorite park or in the forest. And then there's also the spirit of oak with a capital O that, that oversees all oak trees. And plants are interesting in that we can touch the collective and the individuated at the same time. And, and that can feel kind of confusing to our very singular individual minds, our singular identities. But I think long before we got to this very kind of separated view of, of the individual and of the world, the idea of the collective, of the communal, of the oversoul was part and parcel of everyday life. So plant spirits are those kind of organizing forces, and they come in lots of different forms. We have those that are the kind of container for the blueprint, the, the oversoul or deva, if you will. We have the kind of nature spirits and elementals who who build according to that blueprint and supply the raw ingredients at the spiritual and material level, respectively. And then we have those individual souls in, in any given plant, any tree or weed or bush or shrub or hedge. Um, and all of those together are, are plant spirits. And they're all situated in a larger context of community, of ecology. Um, I like to think of us as, as being part of an ecosystem of spirit, just like we're part of an ecosystem in the material world. We're, we're often not very aware of either, um, but that doesn't stop them from existing. I was just thinking about um, what you, you were saying about individual soul, or soul of a plant and then the oversoul. And I was thinking about how when I go out for walks, there's a particular place that I like to walk in and there's a particular oak tree that I feel drawn to and which I, let's just say I spend a little bit of time with it. And, but I always find myself sending it love and asking it to spread it to all of its kind. So it just made me think about that um, because I take it as a given because one thing we do know about, um, about trees is that they do communicate underground through chemicals. And I think uh, they're using some fungus as uh, a vehicle. I'm not very um, clear on exactly the mechanism there, but I do know. So I always assume that I can send love to all the oaks in this heath. Um, by sending it to this one. <laughs> so I like the idea of the, of the oversoul as well. Yeah, and you know, it also brings to mind the idea of the soul of the land itself. Um, and, you know, talking about sending the oaks to, sending the love to all the oaks in that heath, in that particular area, they're inherently connected, just like the trees, the physical bodies of the trees, their material presence is connected through their roots and the mycorrhizal network of fungi, in the soil and the other organisms that are there, the individual souls are not just united in the upper planes through that oversoul, but here in, in this world, in the lower realms, they're also connected through the spirit of the land itself, that the substrate in which they grow is also divine and embodied, just like us. And you know that's why we can find the same species of oak in two different places that, that can feel so different and so similar at the same time. We have the individual soul that is unique to each one, even though it's the same oversoul, then we also have the unique environs in which it grew and the land spirit itself is, is overseeing part of the development of that spiritual ecosystem in tandem with the, the physical one. Makes you think about the notion of terroir, you know, where um, the, the attributes of grapes grown in a particular area uh, is, is specific to that area irrespective of the variety that might be grown in other places. So we have kind, we've got that concept in a very physical sense, in a very, uh, but what we're talking about is it being in addition to that, that there's a, an actual spirit of place also. Right, and you know, I don't know if it's, we'll say, outside of that, you know, in addition might, might imply it's, it's, un, uh, one more thing outside of it, but 
what if it's because of that? You know, the spirit of that land shapes the territory. It, it has to hold the space for the devas of sun and rain and cloud and fog and whatever other, um, we'll say, uh, atmospheric phenomena might be in place. But it's also going to hold the blueprint for what seeds will come and flourish, what organisms we can't see with the naked eye, who's going to visit um, long term or short term. So it's all interrelated. We, I, I love embracing this with both science and animism together because it allows me to, to measure and compare, but it also holds space for the fact that in a spiritual sense, it's all very messy and we don't have to have it figured out. And that's the beautiful thing. There, there are other things out here who have it figured out and we don't have to understand it for it to work. No. So how can we become better at tuning in to plant spirits? So I be, at the moment, it feels like my communication with my plants is very one way. I might, I'll sing to them first thing in the morning, say hello to them, touch them. Um, I watch them very carefully so that I can understand if they need water or if they need more light, if they're happy where I put them or not. But I'd like more. So how do I do this? Well, you've already accomplished the first step, and that's observation. So sometimes what we have to do is shift the focus of what we're observing. You know, we, we want to cater to the physical, biological needs of the plant, especially one in our garden or home, in our care. But now if we just kind of move the point of focus just, just a little beyond the physical, it's kind of like those old you know, magic eye posters that were real popular in the 90s. You stare beyond them and that 3D image emerges from that stereogram that's encoded in it. So we kind of have to move our focus beyond just the physical. The physical is the kind of noise we have to see past. And that doesn't always mean that we're physically looking. Uh, not all of us are necessarily attuned to be clairvoyant. Not all of us will be clairaudient. Not all of us are clairsentient. Some of us don't get much of anything at all. And that's okay. Sometimes when we just hold space without expectation, that's a key part. We have to um, let go of that, that ego need to strive and hold. This is the thing I'm trying to accomplish. Just surrender. And just be willing to sit in that uncomfortable silence for a while and see what emerges. Plants don't communicate the way we do. They, they can't. They don't have larynxes. They don't have mouths and tongues and teeth and lips. So the, the language they speak is very subtle at first. And the more we get acquainted with it, the more we recognize that it might show up in other ways. So if we want to kind of accelerate this beyond just the observation, um, there are some meditations that we can do. We often call them um, plant spirit attunements. And there are some kind of like reciprocal breaths that we can do. You know, imagine that as they um, engage in photosynthesis, they are bringing in carbon dioxide and releasing oxygen. So we do the opposite through cellular respiration. So we can exhale our CO2 and inhale their, their oxygen. And that can be a kind of um, mutual blessing that we do if we do it with intention. We might envision meeting a, a plant spirit in our kind of inner world, our inner sanctuary, our, our inner temple, if you will, that we might visit in meditation, depending on your form of practice. I also have in the book a meditation called the seed to flower meditation, which is a different kind of plant spirit attunement. And you either have to know the life cycle of the plant or be willing to be very imaginative and kind of make it up as you go. Um, and, and picture yourself witnessing the seed of that plant um, entering the earth and then sprouting and then growing to full size and maturing to bear flowers, which transform to fruit, which yield seeds. And then after you do this, you can start to imagine that you are the seed. And then you are experiencing this in a very real kind of tangible way. So you pull in all the sensory input you can. Imagine what it feels like to be buried. Imagine what it feels like to sprout forth, what it feels like to drink in sunlight and breathe in air. Um, and draw in nourishment through the roots. And it can be a really powerful way to help you kind of attune to the energies of that plant, to its archetypes or symbolism. And that opens the door to better communication in the long run. I like that. So what we're doing is perhaps initially using our imaginations, but that is opening us up 
um, to being more sensitive, more empathic towards the plant, which then opens the door for uh, a connection. Yeah, and very importantly, it also gives the conscious mind something to do because so often, I think, especially for people who might be new to the idea of plant spirit communication, we're waiting for something to show up in the fore of the mind. You know, you go, hi, I'm Nicholas, nice to meet you. And you're waiting for that foxglove to say, oh, hi, Nicholas, I'm I'm Digitalis purpurea. It's so nice to meet you too. And that's not gonna happen for like 99% of people. It's not gonna show up that way. Uh, and in the 1% of the people, it does show up show up that way, how much is projection and how much is perception, right? So when we give the conscious mind something to focus on, whether that's plant spirit communication or crystal healing or color therapy or just good old fashioned mindfulness meditation, when the conscious mind has an objective that is engaged but not distracting, it keeps it on track, on task in a way that still makes space. You know, if we have such a rigid focus, this is the only thing that can happen, then we lose all the stuff outside of this little bandwidth. But with that kind of imaginal state that we enter, there's there's room to grow and breathe and, and for things to kind of come in through the back door of our consciousness, you might start to feel the plant spirit in your body. You might start to see colors or recognize your own emotional state and go, oh, wow, this kind of inner joy and alignment I feel that every time I do this meditation with foxglove, maybe maybe that's not about me and that's about foxglove. I like that. I like that very much. You mentioned intention at one point, and I think in, intention is obviously very um, important in every respect. So how can we use flower essences, or I don't like to use the word use because it implies that we're taking advantage in some way. And in the context of our conversation, that doesn't feel right. Um, but how can we combine ourselves with flower essences in a, a sense of ritual with a pure intention for good. How can we do that? Well, we've got lots of ways that we can do it. As long as we have that, that framework of cooperation, of co-creation, of participation, rather than, like you said, using mandating, forcing. It's, it's never like that with a spirit relationship, whether whether we are kind of formless animists or you know maybe more structured ritualists. Um, there's always agency. All parties have agency. So, you know, first and foremost, develop rapport with that. It could be doing these kind of plant spirit attunements. It could be growing them in your garden or going to visit them in nature and just spending time with them. That's a really kind of passive way to practice attunement. We could also take the flower essence regularly to kind of observe how it shows up in our lives and just allow it to kind of integrate even if it doesn't necessarily represent the emotional state we're trying to change, if the other kind of folkloric properties of the plant are something we want to work towards, you know, taking that flower essence in or using it topically or environmentally can be a way to kind of saturate us with the blessings, the virtue of it. So we're more prepared to show up with it and for it and not just receive from it. And then when it comes to ritual itself, you know, whatever ritual action you're undertaking, burning a candle, meditating, uh, maybe something more complicated. Um, the idea is that we want to hone that intention. We want to um, recognize that intention, while important, is only part of the equation. So, you know, what are we putting into this energy-wise? What is our emotional state like? If, if we don't feel the result we're aiming for, we're probably not going to get it. We're, we're expecting that plant to do too much labor for us if, if we can't provide some of that raw energy, so to speak. Um, so that's the fuel. And then the ritual actions themselves, whether subtle or complex, that's the vehicle. So intention is our steering wheel. And it's important if you don't have a steering wheel on your car, you, you only go in the direction the wheels are pointed in. Um, but also you can have a vehicle and a steering wheel have the best of intention. And if there's no raw energy, no emotive fuel behind it, it's like having an empty gas tank. So we got to make sure we've got those three components kind of aligned. And I think it's helpful to always kind of, let's say, uh, 
peel the layers of the onion down to really get to the core point, the core intention. You know, maybe that's abundance, but what is your roadblock to abundance? What is the obstacle to it? And then, you know, comparing that answer to the various flowers that you might have in your toolbox, whether they're flower essences, or maybe you're going to work with actual plants in your garden. Either way, you know, really think about how those show up differently. Um, it's the same with crystals and anything else. You know, we, we, we can't memify our lives. We can't be super reductive and prescriptive and expect universal outcomes. In fact, the clinical studies looking for therapeutic effects of flower essences, the ones that have failed are the ones that try to treat them universally rather than meeting people at the individual level. And the other side of this is people have to meet the spirits at the individual level too. So if we really wanna partner with them, if we really wanna co-create for a positive outcome, get in that state of relationship, however that's gonna show up for you in your practice, get the, the methodology and tools that you want, whether that's a, a, a candle, a chalice, you're gonna meditate, and you're, you're just gonna make yourself a little, a little potion, if you will, a, a dosage bottle where you're mixing flowers together, but you know, get your vehicle and then show up in the right state of resonance, the right state of everything. So you have that emotional power, uh, emotional fuel to, to be driven by your intention in the first place. Well, I love it. And you've given us so much to, to think about today, but your book is rich, absolutely rich with information. And I love that you have a whole section to individual flowers. And that also includes the astrological links because being a psychological astrologer myself um, and being very interested in um, the tradition of medical astrology and herbalism. Um, and then the pairing also of sacred oils and plants. This is yet another um, link between two loves of mine. So Nicholas, I want to thank you very much for your time today. Well, the pleasure is all mine. Thank you so much for having me on the show. And I'm so grateful that the book resonated with you. Oh, indeed, it, it has. And just a reminder to everyone that this book is called Flower Essences from the Witch's Garden. And there it is. Um, I will be putting a link to that in the description box. And Nicholas, is there a website that people could visit to find out more about you and your work? Absolutely. So um, if anyone is interested in learning more about the things that I do and the other offerings that I've got, my other books, you can find me online at theluminouspearl.com. And if you're on social media, I'm probably on social media as at the luminous pearl in most places. You can find me on um, Instagram and Facebook and TikTok that way. And I'm, I'm most active on Instagram for sure, but um, I do uh, as much free content there as possible. And I do believe that you have a workshop coming up in London at the College of Psychic Studies in April. Is that right? Yeah, so um, I have a, a, a virtual class being hosted by the College of Psychic Studies in April that is all about plant spirit communication. So I'll be putting a link to that in the description box as well for those. Um, well, actually, because it's virtual, anyone can attend. So it doesn't matter where we are. So I'm delighted. Um, I will be putting a link to that in the description box, too. And thank you once again. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all for watching. Um, next time, we're going to be looking at telepathic communication with animals. Until then, uh, or before then, do remember that you can also check out my website to find out what I'm up to. Until next time, goodbye.